Hello and welcome to the Wise Mind Collective. With the recent release of Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, I was inspired to look back into a subject that has interested me for a very long time. I've always been fascinated by the history of World War II and the lasting impact that it has had on human society. And it's hard to imagine anything more impactful than the development of the first atomic bomb. So sit tight and let's have a look at how this weapon came to be and what made it work to such devastating effect. Today we're delving into one of the most significant events in the 20th century, the development of the first atomic bomb as part of the Manhattan Project. It was Dr. J. Robert Oppenheimer and his team at the Los Alamos Laboratory who delved into the secrets of nuclear fission in order to employ them in the creation of this groundbreaking weapon. A moment that can be summed up best in Oppenheimer's own, I'll admit, somewhat abridged words. We knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. To understand how we got to this somber yet sobering moment that Oppenheimer describes, we must first look at the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project arguably has its roots going as far back as the late 1930s, with efforts being made to investigate the weaponization of nuclear fission well and truly predating America's entry into the war. But it wasn't until 1943 when the laboratory directed by Oppenheimer was founded in an isolated mesa in Los Alamos, New Mexico, that theory began to move toward reality. Oppenheimer and his team were given the task of developing methods to reduce fissionable material down to pure metal and to formulate a means of rapidly bringing those materials together to achieve a supercritical mass. This would result in a nuclear explosion. Of course, a nuclear explosion isn't very valuable in a time of war if all you can do is set it off in your own backyard. So the team was also tasked with developing a way to take that nuclear explosion and put it in someone else's backyard. In other words, they needed to develop a bomb. A bomb that could be dropped from an aircraft and detonated at a predetermined moment in its descent, maximizing the devastation it could yield. By 1945, the cost of the Manhattan Project had climbed to a staggering $2 billion, but this was not without good reason. With over 30 project sites and more than 100,000 workers, the undertaking was actually getting results to match its escalating price tag. The team were aware that theory supported two possible paths toward the bomb, uranium-235 or plutonium-239, with both of them having been in production since 1942. This was thanks to Enrico Fermi's work that year, where his research at the University of Chicago resulted in the first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction while also establishing the method for production of plutonium. For the Manhattan Project, this raised the question of Pukwena los dos, and so it was decided that both materials would be utilised for their own distinct bombs, coming to be known as Little Boy, a gun method uranium bomb, and Fat Man, an implosion method plutonium bomb. The gun method uranium bomb was far better understood than its counterpart. In simplified terms, the gun method uses an explosive to accelerate, or shoot, one mass of uranium-235 into another mass of uranium-235. The collision creates what is referred to as a supercritical mass, where the mass of fissionable material is sufficient to sustain a nuclear reaction. The reaction itself is triggered by a separate burst of neutrons introduced by an initiator. 
These neutrons begin the process of splitting uranium nuclei, which along with releasing a large amount of energy, also creates additional free neutrons that will go on to repeat the process again and again, resulting in a nuclear bomb level of energy. On the other hand, the process of producing plutonium had revealed that the product created featured a rapid spontaneous fission rate, which if deployed using the gun method, would result in a premature chain reaction greatly diminishing the energy released. So another method would need to be developed, and unlike the gun method, this would also need to be tested. The plutonium bomb would rely on an implosion of the reactive material rather than a collision of two separate masses. At the centre of the bomb was a sphere of plutonium, about the size of a soccer ball, and this was encapsulated by a shape charge composed of conventional explosives. The outer layer of explosives would be detonated, causing rapid compression of the plutonium, resulting in it reaching supercritical mass. The reaction is then initiated and sustained in much the same way as the uranium bomb. However, the amount of fissionable material was much smaller, while the resulting explosion even more devastating. This method would be tested on July 16, 1945, about 210 miles south of Los Alamos, an event that would be named Trinity by Oppenheimer. The first prototype plutonium bomb, given the name Gadget, was hoisted to the top of a 100-foot test firing tower, and at exactly 5.30 a.m. on Monday, July 16th, the atomic age was born as the device exploded over the New Mexico desert. The final calculations held that the explosion released energy equivalent to 21,000 tonnes of TNT, or 21 kilotons which was four times greater than what had been predicted by many of the scientists at Los Alamos. In fact, it was this test that inspired Oppenheimer to recall those now famous words from the Bhagavad Gita. But Oppenheimer was not alone in feeling the psychological impact of Trinity, as the terrifying destructive power of the bomb, along with its eventual use, would haunt many of the Manhattan Project scientists for the remainder of their lives. With the success of the Trinity test and the theoretical reliability of the uranium-based design, the bombs were made available for use in the war against Japan. August 1945 was not a glamorous moment in history, with Little Boy, the uranium bomb, being dropped first at Hiroshima on August 6, and Fat Man, the plutonium weapon, to follow three days later at Nagasaki on August 9. Estimating the total number of casualties caused by the bombs has been a difficult endeavour, with the figure falling somewhere between 110,000 and more than 200,000. But in the wake of this utter destruction, it was only a matter of days before Japan would offer their surrender, marking the final moments of the war. Although nuclear weapons heralded in the end of World War II, they also opened the curtain for the atomic age. This is a subject worthy of its own video, but it is safe to say that the world would never be the same. Nuclear weapons development would continue, the political landscape would shift, nuclear power generation came into being, and so did a new war, the Cold War, which would eventually end along with the Soviet Union. Finally, we come all the way to the present, 78 years after the Trinity test, where nuclear weapons continue to threaten humanity, while nuclear energy, in the form of fusion, offers a tantalizing sci-fi-like salvation. So, was splitting the atom one of humanity's greatest achievements, or did it mark a fork in the road where we chose to proceed down the darker path? Let me know in the comments, and while you're down there, if you enjoyed this video, then please leave a like, and if you feel like being an absolute legend, then go ahead and subscribe to see more content like this while also supporting my tiny little channel, which I would love to grow into something awesome that I can share with more inquisitive people just like you. Thanks for watching. It means the world. I'll see you next time.